Good morning and welcome to Cosmic Conversations here on Morrison Planetarium's Facebook Live page. My name is Ryan Wyatt and I'm the Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization. And I'm being delighted to be joined here uh, today by Juna Kalmeyer, who is the uh, Director of the Fifth Phase of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, as well as an astrophysicist at the Carnegie Observatories. So welcome, Juna. Hi, everybody. Welcome to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a... Uh, um, yeah, it's a great chance for us to, to just get a little bit of background on you, Juna, and to, to chat. Um, we've got uh, people tuning in. Also, I should note on the Open Space um, uh, YouTube page, uh, and I noticed that Alex Box, who is one of the programmers of Open Space, is actually uh, watching in too. So um, we're going to hey, be <laughs> so we're going to be um, chatting a little bit, and then also. Um, talking about uh, some of the visuals that we'll use here from the open space software that we use in a lot of these programs. Uh, but Gina, actually, so one thing I wanted to start out with is we're gonna talk a little bit about sort of the, um, the, the, the way that theory and observation work together in astronomy. And often we talk about this as like theoretical astronomers, theoretical astrophysicists and observational astronomers, but, but you kind of wed those together because your background is sort of in theory, but you're leading like one of the largest observing <laughs> campaigns ever. So, so how did that happen? Well, they don't let me go near the telescope. Let me just be clear about that. Um, no, I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> you know, so for me, the separation of theory and observation is, um, it's more of a time management issue as opposed to an <laughs> epistemic uh, distinction. Um, so, yeah, so so I mean, I'm just really excited about theoretical modeling, and also really excited about experimental work. And I would just say that for me, um, I just care about understanding the material universe. And sometimes you need to do some math to figure that out. Sometimes you need to, you know, have a huge survey uh, to figure that out. And and it's all about figuring out what the world really is and and how to and how we how we go about that. So I just view theory and observation as different tools in the toolkit. Um, I do think that there are there are some people who just don't like using those those different tools. You know, some people don't want to get messy with experiments. Some people don't uh, you know kind of want to live in the sort of la la land of mathematics. But um, for me I I like to do both. And so <laughs> that's Very why cool. I find myself um, uh, in in this in this uh, sort of superposition state, I would say. Do you find that it's like sometimes it's observations that lead theory, and sometimes it's theory that leads observations, or do you think it's more one way than the other? In astronomy, uh, I would say that observation has led theory more often than not, uh, just because. Um, you know, just because of the vastness, as we're going to see, of of our uh, of the phenomenology and just the um, uh, the the scope of it. But of course, there are punctuated points where theory has completely uh, completely led the way. Uh, I mean, so if you even take examples, of course, we always think about general relativity, but even that was sort of inspired by observational anomalies. The one that I think is most in this vein is black holes, right? So people started thinking about black holes right after Newton's Principia came out because they were trying to understand about uh, trajectories of things going fast uh, with, you know, and falling back to the earth and, and could, could you have something that, um, that couldn't escape. And so I would say in that, you know, in that particular example, I think theory really led the way. There was no, um, you know, there was nothing in people's experience that would have brought them to black holes, right. um, but they actually just just kind of followed the math. So, so I would say it's it's a little column A and a little column B, but I think in general in astrophysics, uh, observation tends to tends to reveal that our imagination is lacking, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so you gotta follow, you gotta always follow the math, uh, but 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 look at the data. Well, and of course, humanity has been observing the sky since we evolved on this planet. So I think that's kind of where we wanted to start the discussion yeah. today. Um, so I think we have an image of a, a painting yeah. from a pretty well-known location on Earth. 
Yeah, so this is the this is the uh, the the room of the bulls in the Lascaux caves uh, in France, and this painting is uh, about seventeen or eighteen thousand years old. Uh, and and what I like about this is you can sort of clearly see uh, in the upper right hand uh, corner you've got what looks like seven stars or the Pleiades, and then um, in the in the bottom left, of course, you got this big bull in the middle, which you know the Pleiades are as we'll see in a second near Taurus, mm -hmm. and then you've got uh, something that looks maybe like Orion's belt um, in in the in the lower left, and so. This is a particularly striking example because you can imagine um, early peoples, you know, they, you know, they're busy trying to survive, and then they've got some uh, some time on their hands. <laughs> once they get fire, and they're Maybe. and they're they're trying to like, grapple with what they're seeing and trying to understand what they're observing in the sky. So we can always debate any one of these uh, individual archaeological. Um, findings and there are astronomers who, who don't think that this corresponds right. to the sky. If you go back to the sky picture, you can kind of see with your cursor where the Pleiades is and there's Taurus and Aldebaran and you can kind of see the, the horns there. And then Orion, of course, in the lower left. And so for most of us, um, you know, w when you see this pattern, you're like, oh yeah, that's what they were painting in Lascaux. Uh, but I think the bigger issue is just that people were trying to understand the physical world and were trying to understand you know what they were dealing with and it, and and at that point in time of course understanding the heavens and understanding the cosmos was a matter of understanding when the weather would be good right. and when food would be available and so it was just super deep uh in our kind of evolutionary uh uh track here yeah. um, and that's something that I think is is we're still on that <laughs> on that in that pursuit, and it's it's very old and it's very universal. So it's you know these are the French caves, but everywhere mm -hmm. there were people, there's stuff like this. <laughs> right, <laughs> and it's yeah, from so many cultures around the world and different representations that have sort of commonalities and differences. It's really amazing to see. Yeah, and I think that um, you know the story of modern astrophysics and particularly what we're doing in SDSS is um, is a story of of the universe getting bigger and bigger and bigger uh, to humans, right? <laughs> so the <laughs> right. It is, doesn't care about what we know or don't know about right. it. Um, but, you know, our world started out, you know, pretty small, confined to the earth. Then uh, eventually, um, you know, people, you know, we have the uh, sort of Ptolemaic picture of the universe where, uh, you know, where the earth is at the center. And this is sort of the Aristotelian view with the, you know, got fixed spheres of stars. Uh, and that, of course, a representation of that too, that we can show. Yeah. Yeah. And of course that fixed sort of sphere of stars, that's not unique to, um, uh, to, uh, to Aristotle and his uh, uh, successors. That was, uh, that was something that was in, other mythologies uh, across the globe, uh, and and here's the of course this is the <laughs> this is the Earth centered picture of of the world, and I think I think Ryan one of the nice things to point out here is that you know before uh, before we overturn this, and of course we mm -hmm. associate that with Copernicus, Aristarchus had put forward a theory that the sun was at the center of the world and that the earth was was rotating or you know the uh, the ball of fire was at the center of the universe and the earth was going around it um, of course th and that was uh, that was several uh, you know almost you know 2000 years before yeah. <laughs> before this picture is made <laughs> and so well, sometimes um, ideas take a while to sink in i guess yeah <laughs> that's right um and course, yeah, what I find yeah. fascinating about this image, I think I mentioned, is like Earth, like that's a pretty good Earth, like that map of Earth, because this is from 1660. So like we really had a good sense of what Earth looked like, and yet the rest of this is just like all wrong. Like <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Right. No, that's right. And I think that's another, um, what I like about the Aristarchus uh, sort of uh, Ptolemy Copernicus story is that um, there's always some, you know, people agreed on this on this Ptolemaic view of the of the universe, even when there was another another model that actually was better. And it and it took um, it took 
you know, it took 2000 years to, to figure that out. And I always just in the back of my mind, hey, that's a lot of generations. What, what ideas do we have now right. that we're so confident and we're so confident about, but actually are so incorrect. <laughs> what, what's our geocentric baggage that we need to get? Yeah, what is our geocentric baggage? And and I think, um, and you're going to see this too, um, uh, you know, when we talk about, about just the size of the universe and how, uh, you know, how people struggled with that even a hundred years ago. So you don't have to go back to the, right. you know, ancient times to find that people, you um, you know, people did not really appreciate the scale and scope right. of the universe. And, and I think we still don't appreciate it. Well, we can switch back to our uh, digital universe view of with open space. And uh, I've kind of kept us close to earth, but now I can pull away to reveal our uh, very uh, specifically heliocentric perspective. <laughs> um, <laughs> excuse me, the sun is kind of at the bottom of the screen, but as I pull away, we should see uh, that come into view. Yeah, so you so as we're gonna pull out here, you know, get out of the solar system, uh, you can see the Milky Way coming into view, appreciating that um, you know that the sun is just one of you know <laughs> uh, uh, you know vast swath of uh, of stars in the in the in the galaxy, um, and then if you're pulling out of the galaxy entirely, just looking at the Milky Way itself. Um, just realizing that you know we're in the outskirts of the Milky Way. We kind of are in the suburbs. The density by us is not super impressive. You know, the big city is right. you know, thirty-five thousand light so years away. <laughs> yeah. um, and and there we are, kind of uh, kind of in the outskirts. Uh, and and I think figuring out about our place in not just the Milky Way, but in the broader cosmos has, I mean, that's the name of the game and that continues to be the name of the game. Um, and it will be the name of the game for the next uh, little bit here as well. Um, so, yeah, so so um, so what, one thing I should say is that what part of what we're doing in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is trying to assess where, uh, you know, this is, and then that's been a mm -hmm. huge, uh, huge aspect of um, of what SDSS has done, both the Milky Way itself and then externally with with the, with the galaxies and quasars, and we'll we'll show that in a little right. bit. Well, I think um, we can start to talk about where this story of kind of expanding the size of the universe started um, by kind of shifting our focus over to uh, the Andromeda galaxy. So if we leave yeah. our Milky Way behind. Um, do not be distracted by the multicolored dots. We'll talk about those <laughs> more in a moment. But to get us uh, just the a, next just stop, couple, Andromeda. <laughs> right, just a couple million miles, a million layers away here to uh, to Andromeda. So Andromeda is super important because, um, again, we uh, and this is a sort of this is a beautiful picture of Andromeda that we now have. Uh, we can see. Um, uh, you know, we can see the spiral structure. Uh, we can see its companions. We can see uh, all of this, all of this structure. And the big question, the big question a hundred years ago was: Is this thing, which they couldn't see very clearly a hundred years ago, is this thing like the Milky Way? Is it an island universe like the Milky Way, or is it um, kind of more like a group of stars or some type of a ionized nebulae uh, within the right. galaxy? When they were called spiral nebulae for for many years, right? Just as a sort of catch-all yeah. term, like whatever that means. <laughs> yeah, or, or yeah, yeah. I mean, even um, I mean, they they use the word fuzzy rigorously in a <laughs> hundred years. Ago. Um, so, so, so this is another example of one of these common misconceptions, right? That that people uh, people have, and of course. Um, when this great debate happened a uh, hundred years ago, people were arguing two things. They were arguing about the size of the Milky Way itself. So was the Milky Way mm -hmm. super big or right. was it super small? And were these were these spiral nebulae inside the Milky Way or outside of the Milky Way? And the interesting thing is that, um, and this was the, uh, the famous debate between uh, Curtis and Shapley. And, uh, the interesting thing there is that they were both right and they were both wrong. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Shapley is arguing that 
these spiral nebulae are outside of the Milky Way, obviously. Um, the Milky Way is not that big and these things aren't that big and it's no big deal. Uh, and they have to be far away because at that time, um, uh, Henrietta Swan Leavitt had figured out about the relationship between uh, luminosity and distance. And so uh, from the Cepheid stars, and so it was like, these things are far away, like, let's just move on. And of course, Curtis was like, the Milky Way is huge. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> or maybe I have that reversed, I should, uh, uh, but yeah, the Milky Way is big uh, and these things are inside the Milky Way. Right, and and they both suffered from the same confusion, uh, and that was that the size of the whole universe couldn't be that big to accommodate both a big Milky right. Way and an external Milky Way that was huge. So it was the size of the universe that was the common block that they both shared. That's right. Um, so I don't, uh, yeah. So 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 in terms of, uh, and of course the the, the thing that solved this was uh, Edwin Hubble's uh, observation from, from Carnegie's Science Bench Telescope, uh, which we see here. And of course, this now shows what Andromeda was looking like 100 years ago. And you could see it's it's not so obvious that it's a Milky Way. It just right. looks like a smudge. Right, um, you gotta kind of fill in the details if you're looking at that. Yeah, um, and so you can see in the upper right-hand corner, um, Hubble had previously marked something N uh, for Nova, <laughs> Uh, which would have been, um, you know, which would have been a, a, a you know, a star that was brightening uh, in the Milky Way. And then he crosses it out and you've got that big red bar. Uh, and it's a variable and that puts this object, first of all, it, it changes the whole size of the universe, right? Because right. now it's Andromeda yeah. at its proper, uh, or puts Andromeda far away and puts it outside of the Milky Way and also then establishes the Milky Way is indeed very large. And so is this thing. So a red here, and of course, this is the basis for um, yeah. for Hubble's uh, distance redshift relation, which is what he called it. <laughs> also, the expansion of the universe. Uh, right. so, so once you have the distances and you have their velocities, you can make this uh, this you can plot one against the other, and you can show that the galaxies are receding away from one another and that the universe is expanding. And so this is like, this is one of these uh, situations where it's a super uncomfortable moment for <laughs> everybody because, um, because the world has gotten so much bigger. The universe has gotten yeah. so much bigger than people had appreciated. And not only is it much bigger, but it's also dynamic. And so it's, it's even uncomfortable for, um, it's even uncomfortable for theorists, right? Uh, because theorists were really into a kind of static universe that could be understood and you know written down. And and the dynamic universe, of course, we now know uh, lambda, uh, and we now have the accelerated expanding universe. Um, but but at this time, you know, the universe was was small. And this is a clear case of observation leading theory then because you've got this, oh, yeah. this set of observations of like you've just got to grapple with. Uh, the other thing I think just is worth noting because I mean, it depends uh, on who you talk to right I mean like you know the people who were who, the people who were solving uh you know the, the the people who were solving the equations of general relativity and the people like Lemaitre and uh Friedman right. Alexander Friedman you know they were like what are you talking about <laughs> this is how we thought it should go uh, all right uh, but so uh, these things. So it's almost like matchmaking at that point. Like, oh, we've got these <laughs> observations, and oh, look, there's this theory that actually goes really well with that. Huh. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so I think at this point, but I think the the point is um, really what people understood viscerally about mm -hmm. the size and scale yeah. of the universe, and 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 um, not what they can, not what you know. The difference between physics and mathematics is mathematics is you know universes that can be. You know, right. physics is the universe that is. So when you find that the universe that is uh, is doing this crazy stuff, <laughs> that is um, that's 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 unsettling, I think, for for yeah. people sometimes. Um, if you like to sometimes live in the world of mathematics, it's not a problem at all. And that's why I also I mean, going back to what we opened with. That's mm -hmm. why I think it's important to kind of cherish both of these pursuits because you really miss out if you're only focused on theory or focused on experiment. Yeah. 
Actually, going back to the plate for a moment, I think just one thing that's kind of interesting about this, because we're seeing this, um, which is really basically a photographic negative. So it's the, you know, the bright center of the galaxy appears as the black blob in the middle. Um, but I guess it's what I find really amazing about this is, um, like this was a physical object, like that that Hubble wrote, like wrote on, crossed something off and wrote something else. Like, and it's so, in our digital era today, like it's so hard to kind of wrap your head around like the, just the physicality of this, I think is very, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, astronomy used to be uh, for, you know, for thousands of years, a pretty rough, rough pursuit in that, you know, you, you know, we're sitting in the cold all night long trying to, um, trying to, right. to, you know, so the dedication was, was very high. Now, um, I mean, and, and now what we, we are so much, um, you know, we're so spoiled by technology and by just our augmented senses that now the it's still you know it's still challenging, but in a in a in a not as much in the in the way that it is. But I mean, okay, you know, you spend decades working on a spacecraft and then you know it launches and it blows up. Like there are different types of uh, trauma that <laughs> astronomers <laughs> deal with, other than being cold, you know, every now and again. <laughs> Well, I guess now we should actually explain maybe what what all these. Yeah. Are. So, so, so you know, so so Hubble's discovery involved you know less than fifty galaxies. You know, he had to throw away a few galaxies where he couldn't get uh, good spectra. Yeah. And part of what has happened from that moment on, you know, that's really the first galaxy redshift survey. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, it's getting more galaxies, understanding, okay, what, what is this expanding place about? What are, what is the diversity in the galaxies themselves? And so what we're looking at are um, over time, how humans have, um, have done this and, and SDSS was an important, um, an important player in this, um, uh, in sort of industrializing this. But of course, there were other redshift surveys that were, uh, were finding things uh, before SDSS, and in particular, it motivated SDSS. In fact, and in particular, when you start doing the first redshift surveys with kind of a thousand galaxies, you start to see that these galaxies are not smoothly distributed all over the place. They are all over the place, but they're clumpy. Yeah. They're in groups. And now people knew about clusters of galaxies from way back in the day, but the idea that the whole structure of the universe itself was clumpy like this, um, that, that, was, uh, that was surprising and that was informative, right? So you can yeah. look at this structure in great detail and figure out about things like, you know, so this isn't just random. Right. What this is, is um, this is the structure that's set up by the dark matter um, itself, uh, and the sort of scaffolding that's holding up, um, you know, these or these galaxies live in these over densities. So galaxies, you know, if you if you if you throw a dart in the universe, um, you know, you're you, you you're gonna eventually hit a clump of galaxies. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of thing too. <laughs> Each individual dot that we're showing then is an individual galaxy, and and so. so yeah, really so Every, every dot in this video is, uh, you know, in this in this thing that we're seeing, every dot in this video is something like a Milky Way or an even bigger galaxy, right. typically. There's some smaller ones, too. Um, but the Milky Way is a very typical galaxy. Andromeda is pretty typical as well. Um, it's not so typical to have Milky Way and Andromeda right next to one another. So that's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Uh, but, but every single galaxy here you're looking at um, is... Uh, Every single dot here is is a galaxy, or I think are the quasars on yet? Or uh, not yet? I can pull back farther. I kind of stuck yeah, to yeah. relatively close to home, but we can pull back and actually show more of the Sloan data. Uh, yeah. Well here. Yeah. So those early surveys really motivated that clumpiness of those early surveys really motivated. Okay, what is this structure really looking like? And now you can see as you pulling out. Now you see this structure, but you also see it's there a more homogeneity, right? Because we're looking mm -hmm. on a scale in which you do have homogeneity and isotropy. Um, so the Copernican principle. And, and so, 
probably worth noting that the universe isn't actually like shaped like an hourglass. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what you're seeing there in that structure, so where you see dots, that's where the survey has happened. And where you see nothing um, is where uh, we have not taken observations. And so that is where you have a hole in the mapping, in the map itself. So it's like um, a, a bit of the map has been, has, has just not been, has not been made yet. And hopefully we will uh, eventually. So where the sea serpents would have been on that like map. That's right. <laughs> That's right. But yes, the, the, the universe is not hourglass shaped. Uh, <laughs> uh, but this, you know, so now you can start to, and if you pull back really far, um, and then we turn off the galaxies, we can see, and, the, and of course there's also quasars in here and quasars yeah, right. are creating supermassive black holes. And those those are in the centers of, of, of big galaxies. And so now we're gonna pull out to sort of early. Um, um, so Stephen, uh, that's exactly right. So the clumpiness of the galaxy distribution is indeed related to the density of the dark matter of the um, of of in our in our current best cosmological model, uh, over densities in the dark matter lead to over densities in the baryonic matter, and that ultimately allows us to uh, allows the universe, not us, uh, to form galaxies. And and that those over densities come they're they're very they're imprinted very early on in the history of the universe. So what we're looking at now is uh, the cosmic microwave background. And you can see there's, uh, you know, there's there's red dots and there's black dots, and they have different uh, different intensities. And this pattern of over now mostly the cosmic microwave background is extremely extremely smooth, you know. So the difference between the a red dot here and a black dot here it looks very dramatic, but actually it's you know in temperature it's you know a part in a hundred thousand. So these are tiny 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 <laughs> fluctuations in the intensity of the cosmic microwave background. And those are the tiny, tiny little seeds of all of that structure. And so by analyzing that structure and by analyzing this structure in great detail, we can figure out about, okay, how much dark matter is there? What are the properties yeah. of it? What's the you know history of, uh, uh, this is the thing that tells us that inflation had to happen. Um, now we'd like to understand, okay, let's learn more about that inflationary period in the history of the universe. And this gets us, this is the, the closest that we get to direct um, probing of the, of the Big Bang. This is the, the last scattering surface um, or the era of recombination of the universe. when the universe is, when the universe is cool enough that hydrogen can actually um, come together. Very cool. All right. So now, well, oh, yeah. I don't know if we're gonna. Are we gonna? Go ahead gonna and head home. <laughs> yeah, can do that. Let me just um, bring some of those galaxies back on so that we can see uh, as we head back in. Uh, and I, I should say that it was it was Shapley who thought the Milky Way was big, and Curtis who thought the Milky Way was small, uh, and that the. Uh, yeah, I always get that confused. <laughs> they were both right. They were both wrong. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to make one little adjustment here to make sure that we head home. <laughs> well, we could look at this for hours. I mean, it's, it's true. Yeah, it is. It's pretty captivating. Well, I guess what's interesting too is that although we're showing the locations of the galaxies with these individual points, the clusters of galaxies are also, I mean, they're held together by dark matter. There's all this hot gas. It's like there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's, there's uh, a lot yeah. of stuff going on here. There, you know, in terms of the, um, you know, in terms of what, um, what this, what this, uh, you know, there's a, there's a beautiful, I mean, this is where observation can often uh, lead theory. Uh, there's, mm. there's incredibly rich phenomenology that occurs in every star in every one of these galaxies. Right. And so, um, you know, so if you're interested in weird things, then astronomy is for you because there's, I mean, <laughs> You're just always populating those weird tales of any distribution because there's so many, you know, nature is able to 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 make so much, um, you know, so much rich uh, phenomena. But as we kind of come back, I think it's it's worthwhile to show, uh, you know, now you can see we're getting back to the Milky Way. And here you see these spikes again. 
And that's the uh, that's the the stellar survey of SDSS, uh, the Apogee uh, uh, surveys, and that's about seven hundred thousand stars, uh, where we we've, we've gotten spectra for uh, for them. And of course, getting spectra of all these objects is critical for understanding what they really are um, and, and how they work. And you can see that this is this is the state of the art. Uh, this is SDSS now. Uh, three and four, and this is the state of the art for um, for for surveying the Milky Way spectroscopically, um, you know, with with with, with real spectra. Uh, and in SDSS five, I mean, you can see how you know that's all centered around the Earth because that's where our our telescope right. is. That's where we are. Um, and in SDSS five, we're going to go from seven hundred thousand of these uh, spectra to. Uh, to almost six million of them, and and the important thing is that we're going to be going to the other side of the galaxy, and so um, so just just to give you a sense of how much more there is for us to learn, even about our own galaxy, and and the nice thing is that the lessons that we learn in our galaxy um, are are transported into into others into other galaxies. Um, Sam has a question. How do we know what the shape of our own galaxy is? This is such a good question. Um, it's actually really hard to figure out the detailed shape of the Milky Way <laughs> because we're sitting yeah. in it. Um, we, uh, we actually look at the, the distances and the kinematics of stars and gas in the Milky Way to figure this out. And we look at it in optical wavelengths, we look at it in infrared wavelengths, we look at it in radio wavelengths, we look at it in x-ray wavelengths. So we have to put this big puzzle together. Um, a big, uh, uh, you know, people still argue over the detailed structure of the, um, of the spiral arms of the Milky Way. We're still figuring out about that structure. So we know from the motions of stars about the Milky Way's rotation curve, we can, we can measure those things. And so we can understand um, <coughs> the structure, but in fact, and uh, in fact, there's, uh, you know, and we can see the, the bulge of the Milky Way and we can probe the, the dynamics of the stars in the, in the bulge of the Milky Way as well. But in fact, um, Understanding it's much easier in some respects to see the detailed structure of Andromeda, which is kind of presented to us in a very nice, uh, you know, way compared to the Milky Way itself. So the Milky Way is 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 tricky, but through all of these different probes, we're able to figure out that yes, there is rotational support in the center of the Milky Way. That is, it looks like kind of spherical, but even that structure where uh, you know we debate about. Um, and then you have certainly a disk of stars. You can also, there's different clues about um, the chemistry in the stars look different depending on where the stars are in the galaxy. So the halo stars uh, look uh, on average different than the stars that are in the disk of the Milky Way. And that's because um, those halo stars haven't been en enriched as much in, uh, in, in heavy elements as the stars in the Milky Way. So that's a great question. Um, we so the halo stars would be yeah. partly mapped by apogee here is the stuff that's sort of above and below the plane. And I guess also the stuff um, that's farther away from the center. So you can or? have halo, so halo stars, um, you can have halo stars and above, below, in the plane, you can have them everywhere. Mostly the plane has, uh, you know, by number, they're mostly disk stars in the plane, but you can also right. have halo stars there. Um, the Segway survey, which was kind mm -hmm. of um, uh, uh, in uh, SDSS uh, 2 and uh, and uh, the Segway 1 and 2, um, in SDSS 1 and 2, they looked at stars as well. Um, and those stars were really focusing on the halo. And that's because, because they were so focused on mapping all those galaxies. Uh, and of course, the original goal of SDSS was to get a million redshifts for, for external galaxies. So we've gone in 100 years from, you know, 50 redshifts to a million redshifts. You know, humans, yeah. are, you know, pulling our weight. <laughs> um, and we want more. <laughs> we we need more, um, but but uh, but anyway, those those uh, those stars are 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 preferentially outside of the disk. So the disk is really uh, is really disky, uh, and that's of course because of uh, angular momentum and the dissipation of that uh, into into a disk uh, where where the stars form and that's where they they kind of stay. But there are stars. There's you know the Milky Way has all uh, you know there are stars from the disk that can get. Um, 
pumped up to higher mm -hmm. uh, higher distances above the plane. But typically, if you want to find halo stars, you look away from the away from the disk. But the halo stars are just you know kind of think of a spherical uh, distribution of stars that go out very very far away from the disk. I think it's amazing too to hear about. I mean, and Apogee, I think is part of the story as well as Gaia, which we've talked about in previous yeah. conversations. But it's like just the between the chemistry and the the motions of the stars being able to kind of play back and even learn more about the history of the Milky Way and how much we're figuring out about that is just it's kind of mind blowing. So the thing that has been, um, and Gaia is just incredible. I mean, because Gaia is really pinning down a lot of the positions now of, you know, mm -hmm. billion stars. And so, um, so Gaia, is, Gaia is incredible um, because that just gives us these basic parameters of the Milky Way. Um, Right. What I think is just so fascinating is that if you even look back 20 years, okay, the mm -hmm. idea that we were going to not just be probing the center of the sun with the technique of helioseismology, but right. that we were going to be probing not just the centers of a handful of stars with the um, with the with the technique of astro seismology. This is similar to seismology on Earth, where you got an earthquake mm -hmm. and, and figure out about the structure of the Earth from looking at the oscillations in, um, uh, in at the surface. Mm -hmm. Now we can use this technique and combine it with spectroscopy to figure out ages of stars across the entire galaxy. So the idea that we're going, you know, we have ages for you know, half a million stars and we're gonna have ages for millions of stars. We just have these cosmic clocks all around the Milky Way. That was, that was if, if you had put that on a wish list, you know, maybe 30 years ago, it would have been seen as like a, a, a really ridiculous <laughs> sort of wish. Um, and now it's happening. And, and I think that's a testament to, it's a testament to uh, people's creativity. It's a testament to sort of cross-disciplinary um, learning where people in the um, machine learning and deep learning communities talk to people in the astronomy community and different surveys talk together about how to make these things all work. And, and so I think it's really the story of uh, how how our information, you know, it's a, one of the, the good stories of how um, this sort of information overload age um, right is enabling us, you know, in many ways it's disabling us, but in, in this way, it's really right. enabling us. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's just incredibly exciting because in our theories, we can predict the time evolution of things pretty well, but in observations, it's often very hard to unravel things in time. Mm -hmm. And this allows us to do that with the Milky Way. I guess it's kind of interesting too, because when you think about where we started the program with the case of go and, and, you know, time, was a much more cyclic phenomenon then because it was kind of like the seasonal change. And like you said, the way that to predict when the weather's gonna change and, and that sort of cyclic um, repeating in a certain way, static universe compared to now this very evolving and, uh, and you know, temporally yeah. exciting <laughs> universe that we live in. No, I mean, the, the um, you know, we've gone from, uh, you know, we've gone from sort of a fixed a fixed world, either on our cave or in a glass sphere, or you know, or you know, you've got the Egyptian uh, newt, you know, or you've got, you know, we've gone a, gone to a sort of a fixed ceiling of the universe to this incredibly dynamic, infinite world, uh, which is which is both very humbling and and very um, and very exciting, uh, and you know, and, and I think, I mean, just the idea. I mean, I just think about it. You know, there's just there's just a new sky every second of the day. <laughs> you know, the, just it's different. I mean, something is going off, something is exploding. Uh, we've, you know, gotten a little bit bigger. Um, that is, I think that's a very just intoxicating picture of the world. And, and it's, um, it's also very humbling in terms of what our place in the universe is. Um, it's, it's, it's just amazing that in this relatively, in terms of cosmic time, like let's go to now is just nothing. I mean, just nothing at all. Um, and we've been able to figure out so much and, and, and there are still these huge, huge mysteries. I mean, I certainly hope that my great grandkids are gonna be like, yeah, they used to talk about dark matter and dark energy. Oh my gosh, they were so cute and silly. 
Um, I certainly hope that um, they will look back at us with that type of um, disdain for our ignorance. I just hope that that's, our, that's the arc that we're on, right. <laughs> but also appreciation for yeah. our, our attempts. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, if we don't have any other questions, I don't see any more coming through. So I think um, just thank you very much for taking some time and sort of chatting with us today and, and flying through the universe and, <laughs> and having a little conversation about how big and changing the universe is. Thanks so much, Ryan. This was a lot of fun. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Yeah. All right.